Welcome everyone. This is Lyman, your friendly event producer, and welcome to Office 365 Pulse. So I and the gang at IT Unity would like to welcome you and hope you're all having a great Wednesday. So please welcome the uh, host for Office 365 Pulse, Jennifer Ann Mason. Hey guys, it's Jennifer. I am so excited to be here with you guys today. I'm getting my camera set up and while I'm doing that, uh, Tom is also going to get his camera set up. So we have uh, the awesome Tom Duff joining us today. Um, and he's going to kind of uh, give us some insight on his day to day and what he does um, working with users and at this point. So we're going to have a fun little show today. We're going to um, start out like we normally do, going through all of the updates that have rolled out in the last week. Of course, I worked on the Sway last night, and the office team posted four blog posts this morning. Um, so I didn't get those added to the Sway, but I'll try to talk to them, uh, talk to them each a little bit, and see they decided today was going to be a busy morning. Um, but we'll get that uh, sharing in just a second. As always, there's a section with uh, links that will show up once we start sharing. You guys can open the Sway for yourself. And you're also going to be able to um, uh, follow along on the screen. So, Tom, thank you so much for coming today. We are so, so excited to have you. And we look forward to giving you the third degree at the end of the time. <laughs> awesome. I don't think we can hear you, Tom. You might need to unmute your, yeah. Uh, okay, can you hear me now? Oh, now. Yeah, now we can, better. I can hear you. Now we can hear you. Awesome. Mute buttons. They do amazing things. Yes, 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 yes. Um, <laughs> awesome. Lyman, can you switch uh, switch screen so I can start sharing? Um, and as always, we thank Lyman. Without Lyman and Eric, this this show wouldn't be possible. So we so appreciate everything um, that they do behind the scenes to get us up and going. So. They are much appreciated. We'll get this way going. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to put them into the chat window. We have got some really super fun people in the chat window today. So I am personally going to be disappointed if shenanigans are not happening the entire time we're chatting it up. So, um, you know, the gauntlet's been thrown. I expect you guys to act like goofballs and have a blast in that that room, uh, because I know that's what we would be doing if we were together in person. So uh, Tamara, I expect you to make everyone laugh, okay. except for me when I'm speaking, because that would just be awkward. But you'll probably do it anyway. All right. So today's a pulse, all right? We kind of already went through. We've got myself and um, Tom coming up. So uh, Tom is in the Pacific Northwest. You're in, uh, you're in Oregon? Is that right, Tom? My Portland, Oregon, yes. Yes, Portland, Oregon. Okay, yeah. Portland. Very, very cool. So I've never been to Portland, but I like their I like Oregon wine. You guys have got some great pinots for you guys are at, but you no. Know, hey, if you come out here, I will, full, right now, you know. <laughs> I will give you the full. I'll give you the full tour. <laughs> oh, I'll come. I'll come. So we're probably going to regret making that. Um, awesome. Um, I have big news, and uh, the press release went out um, last week sometime, but I have taken a new position at uh, Planet Technologies. So I am the, the Director of uh, Innovation and Strategic Solutions, uh, which means I get to go in and spend time uh, digging into solutions um, that help you know, bring out the best of what we're already doing inside of Planet and putting things together. It is a great uh, new role on a super awesome team. I am so excited to get in and learn about all the awesome things that Planet is doing in the state and local government and in the education space. Um, so I am loving it right now. I'm just a couple of weeks in. Um, so that is super exciting for me, but I'm having a blast. And so that's kind of my big uh, my big update, so you'll kind of see my blog change and different things like that. You should still see me 
um, all the events that you typically see me at, the Microsoft conferences, uh, probably SP TechCon uh, for the near future. You'll definitely continue to, probably far future too, you'll continue to see me there. Um, but I have switched roles, so I wanted to let everybody know that. Super exciting time for me. I'm loving it, loving it. Um, right. Now we can jump into the updates that we have. Uh, so some pretty interesting updates this time. Uh, nothing that is uh, too super crazy, like rock your world type of updates this week. Um, they put in some activity logging and reporting capabilities for Office 365. I think most people, when they read through this, the thoughts they're going to have are, awesome, you put in what we needed to have. And so they've basically come in and they've put in um, an activity report center so you get to log activities of what your users are doing inside of Office 365. There's 150 different events that you can search on to kind of see what everybody um, is doing and uh, what they've got going. And you've got PowerShell commandlet and a management API. So this is really putting in some of those uh, management features inside of Office 365 that have not, um, haven't been there to date. And so getting things uh, compliant and different things like that. These are just tools that are going to help you get to that point. So those rolled out, they're kind of in that staggering rollout stage, uh, but those should be there. And I am sure that there are a lot of people um, that are waiting anxiously for those types of tools to become available. Um, the next big one, just in time for school, I guess, is Office 2016 for the Mac is now available. So you guys can. Um, you know, download Office 2016 for the Mac, uh, 139 countries, 16 different languages. I know it's been out in preview for a while, and a lot of people um, have used it. So nothing uh, too crazy there. They also did another blog post today about the top 10 questions about Office for Mac. And so that's out there. You can see that. It's, it's pretty interesting and cool stuff. So uh, nothing too crazy there, but people are doing you know, upgrades of different things like that. It's now um, available for you if you have a lot of Mac users internally. Um, the next thing we have, and I thought this one was really cool, is Office 2015. They did a Office App Awards for 2015. And they came out and they gave away um, an award for what they could do with um, apps inside of Office 2015. And so if you go look at it, there's all these different categories. So best user interface um, that for SharePoint add-in versus a Office add-in. Um, they've got different categories here. Most business value for an Office add-in as well as for SharePoint add-in. Um, this is all really cool stuff. What's, what's neat about this with them doing these awards and you getting to see them is if you want to get an idea of what apps are out there, what are good apps, what are uh, things that you can do. Some of these are for purchase, um, some of these are for free, but you can go in and um, look at who's winning these awards. And a lot of times these become uh, trusted advisors um, and vendors for you to work with. So I think that this is really cool. Um, I don't know, uh, Tamara, you guys said you guys are using solely Office 365. Do you guys use a lot of third-party apps um, that are out there? Are you guys just mostly using things out of the box? So um, it's just interesting to see what's out there. I've used some of these. I haven't used all of these. Um, but I think it's a really great list of people to jump in and look and see what they have. So this was released at WPC. I believe that they gave these. Um, Awards out. Um, yeah, somebody asked if we could put this in the chat window. So let me go ahead and add this URL there for you. Um, and you guys can go check those out. Um, I think they released awards at like WPC. I think like every other person at WPC was wearing a badge that was called like award winner. And for a couple of times when we were walking around, I kind of felt like we were in, oh, I shouldn't say this, this is me. But we're like in kindergarten, and everybody gets a trophy for doing something. So everybody was an award winner. Um, I'm probably just saying that because I wasn't wearing something that said award winner. But you know, you could get an award for everything because everyone's a winner. Um, 
but no, these, some of these apps are, are super amazing. So uh, here we go. We have all these. Um, Nintex is all over the place, and I love the guys at Nintex, so it's neat to see best overall, best user interface, most productive, so uh, um, super cool stuff there. So that's another announcement that came out. You'll definitely want to spend some time uh, digging into that and seeing what, um, what you can find there. All right. Next up, we cannot have a call show without saying that Power Query for Excel has made an update. And so, so I don't know, like Power Query for Excel, they have to be this group. I'd love to meet this group of engineers inside of Microsoft that simply has the ability to roll something out, I think, every two weeks. They're rolling out something with like 10 bullet points um, every two weeks consistently. So they are always um, rolling out updates. So if you're using Power Query, you've got new things here. Some improvements to the ODBC connector. So if you're doing different things like that. Um, Low, you, know, you can do fast data load versus background data load. Uh, support for Salesforce custom environments in your recent sources listed, list. Um, and then easier parsing of date and time values. Different things like that. So a lot of these are like usability type things that are making working with Power Query for Excel a lot easier. So if that's um, something that you are using, you can definitely um, um, see these updates live in action. And on they're probably very, very useful. Um, some OneNote updates. I think they take a close second to being the most updated product. But OneNote for iOS and iPad has simply become OneNote now. So instead of having OneNote for Android, OneNote for Windows, OneNote for iPad, and OneNote for iOS, at least on Apple devices, we have iOS and um, um, iPad coming together, one single OneNote app. They also have a, a Today widget, which just kind of shows up. Um, I've accidentally opened it a couple of times, and it kind of gives me a highlight of what's going on today. Um, the document whiteboard and camera, so you're able to document stuff like point your phone at a whiteboard and take a, fit, a picture, and it's actually going to um, show up in your OneNote file, which is you know what you would expect. Um, it's also going to do like page previews, recent notes, different things like that. So um, Tamara asked if it's like Lens. I'd say it's a little bit like Lens. Before when you did it, I guess the OneNote app used the wrong camera. Um, so it just went blank. But they fixed that bug. So now it will actually take a picture. Um, and it's not nearly as cool as Office Lens. But I, I don't know if there's an Office Lens for iOS yet. There, I thought there is one coming soon. Um, but but that's there now. So um, I haven't used OneNote too much on my new iPhone because um, I really just use Mail on my phone. But maybe I'll get there and do that. They also made some updates to, to Android. Um, one of, I guess, the top features in the OneNote Android app is that you couldn't copy sections um, or move pages around in a notebook, which I'm constantly doing. So you couldn't do that. Uh, but now you can. Um, so they released that um, update. And then um, Android Wear. So I guess if you have one of those fun, fancy watches, you can play with Android on, or play with OneNote on your wrist. And I, I just don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm just not hip and cool with the times. But I can't imagine needing something so drastically that I need it on some little tiny square on my wrist to pull up OneNote information. So maybe I'm just missing something. Um, but I can probably still honestly say, if I see you in public like reading OneNote on your wrist, I'm going to point and laugh at you. Um, it, maybe that will change. But right now, I'm going to just point and laugh at you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Tamara's like, I need it right now. I just can't imagine me needing anything in OneNote that I couldn't pick up my phone. Like, like it has to be on my wrist. I just can't. I don't know. Maybe a grocery list. Maybe that would be helpful. But I can't imagine why. I, I don't know. I'm sure there is a like 
really awesome use case that I'm going to be like, oh, that's so cool. But maybe not. Boring meetings, exactly, Tamara. I can not see that yet. too. <laughs> yeah, not there yet. Not there yet. Oh, but oh, Ricky said it could be useful for inputting an audio note. Yeah, that's very true. Like if you wanted to record stuff um, around you, or if you just wanted to talk to it. Okay, so I, I, I could get that. I could get that. Um, I'm not saying it's not cool. I'm just not. I mean, I'm just not necessarily seeing it. Just like. At WPC, they kind of had this like Hololens is going to change the world, and they're doing all of these demos. And I'm like, yeah, like in manufacturing and stuff like that, I can totally see how Hololens is going to like impact the world. I can't see like me putting on glasses and carrying a TV with me from room to room to room. Like it was just, it just seems so like uh, science fiction future movies, but. Yeah, I am. No, nope, so I am not going to be watching. So if you actually at your wrist, will lap at you. Yes. You know, maybe I'll just, like, not wear anything on my wrist and just start talking to it. It just seems very, like, futuristic oh, James Bondy. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah. I, I'm just not cool. I think I crossed over to old somewhere in the last couple of months with all these new things that have come, come out. And I'm just like, why would we ever, like, I, I get it. It's cool, but, you know, what do we need? And then I'm like, I'm not that person. I'm that old. I'm old. Um, so I just crossed over to being old and I'm no longer cool and hip. Um, I just have to live with that. But I'm okay with it. <laughs> um, awesome. Uh, so another thing that Microsoft did is they are uh, reintroducing the partner blog. And so what this basically means is part of their um, office blog that's coming out, they're going to start highlighting partners that are doing things. That's actually super awesome for us because partners are the people on the ground that actually deliver um, content and solutions. And so what that's going to mean typically is someone from Microsoft partners up with a partner and they co-write a blog and highlight different things that are coming. So they linked over here to like three or four different blogs that they um, recently republished out there and then they basically said we're going to start it back up again and we are going to um, we're going to uh, keep publishing this and see this. So I think it's a great idea to see what they're doing with different customers, how partners are working. Um, so definitely want to check that out um, when it comes. Uh, next update. Um, hey, OneDrive for Business. Um, so this is one that they've been talking about for a while. I think I just closed my screen. Okay. Um, they've been talking about for a while of giving um, IT pros more control um, over OneDrive for business. Um, so limiting file sync to domain joined PCs. So unless you're joined to the domain, you can't actually sync your files back and forth. Auditing all actions that are taken there. Managing mobile devices connecting to it. Setting storage quotas. Um, and then preventing people from accidentally sh uh, sharing with everyone or all users. So these are some of the controls um, that are there and that are going to make things available uh, for IT pros to better manage OneDrive, um, OneDrive for business. Um, I am hoping that these will make uh, life a lot easier for people who have to manage OneDrive. Um, implementations and different things like that. So I have a lot of hope for these changes, um, and I think they're going to be uh, super, super cool. Um, other one uh, that came out is documents. Um, documents inside of Yammer now are done. Uh, oh, that's really cool. Tamara said that she had. They haven't rolled out rolled out OneDrive for Business because um, some of these issues. Um, so it'll be interesting to see Tamara. Or Tamara, how this works and if these uh, fill all your needs. I know over the next year they have a ton more stuff coming for OneDrive for Business. So it's like that one that we always want to be the right one and it's so close. But I'm thinking it's going to get there this year. Um, uh, but Yammer, they've got um, uh, edit files and opening files in Office Online. So just another a layer of synchronization where things will be the same. So if I open a document inside of Office 365 or I open it in Yammer, I kind of get that same Office Online experience. So that is a really great change um, that came out. 
uh, recently, so I look forward to that. I just like the consistency of it. It makes it a lot easier to explain to people because you don't have to explain it because it just works kind of the way that they'd expect. So um, super excited about that one. OK. The last update that we have is one that I think is a pretty super major. Um, Microsoft is positioned as a leader in Gartner's 2015 Magic, Magic Quadrant for secure email gateways. Um, and I think that that is super, super awesome. Because what that basically means is that the industry is putting trust behind Microsoft's ability to have a secure email gateway through Office 365. So this is a very big um, acknowledgement and award and something that they've been achieving and, and working towards. And you can see all of the different places that Microsoft is really uh, making investments in security and trust. And it's actually uh, part of the um, WP uh, keynote that they did. There's a clip of it where the general counsel comes up and he starts talking about all the stuff that's going on with security at Microsoft and data compliance like that and legal and I mean I highly recommend you pull up the WPT keynote just to hear um, his pieces on it. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, all the stuff that they're talking about and it's just it's so much information and just such good content. So to see like all of the the way that they care about data and how much you know. For so long, people have said we can't go to the cloud because of X, Y, or Z. Now we're starting to see all of these things come together. And then it's like, well, tell me again why you can't come to the cloud. Because you know we're starting to see the industry take off and, and really understand and see all of these pieces. And Office 365 is really becoming this tool that can work for a large collection um, of users. So I was really happy to see this, um, see Microsoft get positioned in that quadrant, in that position. So I think it's a great position. Um, great position. All right. So talking about that and talking about what they're doing, the other thing that I noticed is the amount of case studies that they decided to publish this month. Um, what I think happened is there was probably a lot of case studies that had to get done in the fiscal year. And since we just reached the end of the Microsoft fiscal year, we saw like six major case studies published all um, within like the last week of their fiscal. So that kind of made me laugh a little bit. I was like, somebody was checking boxes of all the things that they said they would get done before they went on vacation for you know the first of the year. But um, there's some really cool things here. You can see um, we've got Louis Vuitton, um, the Air Force, General Electric. So whether you know you want to fly a plane, you want to buy a refrigerator, or you want a fancy purse, you, you, they're all using Office 365. Um, and then we've also got some other companies, uh, Dorma. We've got Croton, and I'm not sure how you say it. Is it, is it Loeb or L-O-E-B? I'm not sure. Uh, but different consulting companies. And I think it's very um, interesting to be able to go in and see with their case studies what are the specific things that they're doing with Office 365, how they, um, yeah, how they got it. Eric said all of those case studies had projects that had to be funded and spent by June 30th. And I, I laugh at that. You can always tell when it's the end of the Microsoft fiscal. I love it. Stuff just kind of like shows up. And it was like a mass posting. And I was like, oh. That's a lot of case studies. Uh, but it's all good content, so we'll let them do it. It doesn't matter when they post it. It's all good. We got it. Um, so I would encourage you to just take some time and look at these different case studies. I think it's interesting because these case studies are across uh, many different verticals. And so it shows that there really is a large collection of people using Office 365, a lot of customers using it. The sheer size alone of the GE case study and what's going to be happening. I mean, that's a huge win uh, for Microsoft and Office 365. So I would definitely say you know, it's worth your time to grab a cup of coffee one morning and kind of pop through these case studies and see what they've got. Um, then reference them as you're going about doing, uh, doing your work and different things along those lines. So that's kind of our list of updates um, right now. I know the fiscal just ended for Microsoft. The new fiscal is kicking off. Um, I'm guessing things, you know, I'm not sure if they're going to just slow down or if they're going to keep going crazy.
Change 2016 rolled out to public preview today. Um, so that's kind of a big change that something came out. I didn't get that updated in here because, again, the blog post posted right before the show. Um, but Exchange 2016 rolled out. Um, so that's kind of interesting. And then I think we'll keep seeing you know, the same types of things um, rolling out. But those are our updates uh, for today. If you guys have any questions about them, you guys can post it. Um, in the chat room, hopefully you guys all found this uh, helpful, just a quick summary of the changes that have come. And now we're going to switch into the fun part of the show. Um, and that's Yeesh. talking with Tom. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, Tom loves Minions. Um, and I love that Tom loves Minions, and I cannot think of a Minion without talking about Tom. Um, when we were in Universal Studios last year, or not last year, last week for WPC, we were walking around City Walk, and Corey and I were talking. I'm like, look, there's minions. And Tom needs that one and that one. And Corey's like, Tom, what are you talking about? And I was like, Tom, who loves minions? And he's like, you're crazy, whatever. Um, so <laughs> it, was, it was awesome. I, I love it. So I, I meant no offense by that. I think it's, I think it's just awesome. So when did your love of minions Yeah, now start? Tamara has... Uh, good question. We watched the Despicable Me films, and I realized Minions were not supposed to be the major thing involved in the movie, but they just kind of took off, and they're short, they're funny, they're cute. I'd like to say that I may envision all three of those things. And I just, it's funny, people tell you that if you have a collection of stuff, or people think you have a collection of stuff, then you will end up having a collection of that thing. So people send me minion stuff. People send me, you know, minion <laughs> pictures. And when I was in Lewiston uh, a couple weeks ago visiting Sandra Mahan for her birthday, we ended up actually, um, one day we went out and saw the minion movie. And I had kind of joked about getting a minion tattoo. And... and it so happens that she was not adverse to sitting there watching me get a minion tattoo for a couple hours. So I got my first tattoo with a minion on my leg. So we had a good time. It was fun. That, and yes, Tamara, that, Sandra is a very awesome. bad influence in a very good way. Maybe at the end I'll actually that's stand up awesome. and show you my leg that has the tattoo on it. Oh, making you stay till the end. I, I think it's awesome. The last thing I saw you post, was that you were comparing Sandra to the evil villain in the new one. <laughs> I, was, I was like, oh! It's, it's rather humorous. No, it's, it's actually humorous because when you compare a minion, being short, with the evil villainess, uh, Scarlet Overkill, she actually does have that look in terms of being a lot taller than a minion, and the whole thing just kind of jives really nicely, so we play with it and go with it and have fun with it. It's awesome. So what what I'm hearing is that the new Minions movie is based off of your, of your life. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, let's go with that. That <laughs> works. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, okay, rolling it back into SharePoint. Um, yes. I am so glad you could join us today. You are one of my uh, favorites in the community. I love your perspective on things because I feel like you're just so close to the, the actual like real world um, and so you're in it day to day so I'd, I'd love for you to just kind of give us some insight on on what is a day in the life of Tom like at work and what do you focus on and, and what's your passion and, and different things along those lines okay so you know not, not being a consultant I basically work with the same group of customers, and our company has about 5,000 people in it. So I'm pretty much adjusting to and working with just about everything. So, you know, I get help desk cases where somebody says, oh, my document's locked and I can't unlock it. And, you know, other people going, oh, I need to build a custom list or something that does X, Y, Z. And so that's really my job and our job, Sandra and I both do a lot of out-of-the-box type programming, which, you know, you're very familiar with. And so 
we end up being, in a lot of cases, the face of SharePoint for the company. And when people need stuff, they'll say, oh, call Tom, call Sandra. And so we work up this relationship with these people on a regular basis. And because we're able to communicate at a business level in terms of what they need without exposing them to the IT side of things, it makes it very easy for us to be able to interact and get things done in a way that right. they probably wouldn't be able to do if they had to go through a formal consultant role or a formal IT person who you slip pizza under the door to and never let them out because they're embarrassing. Um, you know, we're just, we're easy to talk to. So we're doing everything from education and we've done uh, something that we call Spark University, which are short targeted videos that teach people how to do oh, cool. basic things within SharePoint. Uh, we just started today, in fact, right before we had this one, we had our first Spark Connect session, which is kind of a uh, SharePoint open office hours to where we had probably about, oh, 25, oh. 30 people who joined it and they could just ask questions. You know, what about this? I'm having problems with that. You know, can you explain this? And we just made ourselves open for that. We've got another thing that we're going to do coming up, which we're calling um, Spark Light, and Spark's the name of our intranet. So what we want to do is go through and tell people, hey, we're going to have these short little one-minute tips that we put out on a, you know, one every two, three days. People can subscribe to it, get that information. So we do a lot of education, a lot of development, a lot of troubleshooting, just pretty much whatever has SharePoint attached to it we're going to be touching it over the course of the day. And I'm the only notes guy left in the company. So if there's any notes questions that come up, oh. they still end up coming my way. So. Now, are you, do you guys both sit in IT or do you sit within the business unit? We actually both sit in IT. We're attached to an operational group, so we're not pure development because our SharePoint group is an admin a programmer who really gets into more of the in-depth coding, .NET, things like that. Sandra's our lead, and I'm what I would consider more of a developer where we're taking the out-of-the-box pieces. So Sandra and I will do out-of-the-box stuff. We have the admin going. We have the programmer going for some of the more hardcore things. And within that realm, you know, we pretty much do it all. Very cool. Now, do uh, in your company of 5,000, what is it like? Are there like different uh, business owners that actually have to maintain an intranet site or build collaboration sites, or are there templates that you guys pre-use? Or I mean, with with sharing what you can, what what's like your environment look like at a high level? Right. So when we started with SharePoint back in two thousand nine, it kind of was a bit of a skunk works project, which I'm sure a lot of SharePoint sites started that way. And so we had our intranet, which was the Spark site, and we had things divided up by divisions and departments, and we tried to have division and department and site owners that would be the ones responsible that people could go to to get things done. Um, over time, people move. Governance, you know, tends to wane over time if you're not on top of it a lot. And so what we found was that we still do have some groups of people who are well, we have our division site out on Spark, but that's about it, and none of us really know how to do anything with it. Then we have some people who are power users who want a private team site. They're going to go out and build custom lists, and we'll like, hey, we'll help you. We'll get you going along as fast as you can, and if you have any issues, we'll help support you. So we really do have the range from you know, Luddites who don't want anything to do with anything technology related, clear up to the people who are like, so when are you going to roll this out on mobile to where it really works better and we can actually use it, which is part of our motivation for wanting to go to Office 365. So it's, yeah. on any given day, you can really run into just about anything. Okay, very cool. That kind of keeps it exciting, though. It keeps you on your toes. Yes, it does. <laughs> yes, it does. Okay, so you mentioned Lotus Notes. How does one transition yes, from a career in Lotus Notes to a <laughs> career in SharePoint? Hopefully very successfully, or you may have a short lifespan in terms of your career. <laughs> um, I actually started doing Lotus Notes back in 87, and 
at that point I or actually wow. no I'm sorry I started with I started with the company in 87 in um, oh, 95 1995 1996 I was trying to get out of the mainframe world and into something that was more relevant which at that point was Lotus Notes and we were a large Lotus Notes uh, shop and so I started doing that and then I went to work with Enron for three and a half years, and we all know how that ended, then did consulting for a short period of time, ended up back at the company that I'm at. Um, so at that point within the notes world, I started, uh, thank you, Jim, in 87, and you said you feel old. Um, yeah, okay, we won't go there. Um, so anyway, um, once I got into the notes world, Probably, I was still in it, but probably around 2004, 2005, I really decided I wanted to be part of the community and start doing things like speaking and writing and stuff like that. So I ended up doing two or three magazine articles for Lotus Advisor at the time, which led to an invite to speak at the uh, Lotus Sphere Conference in Orlando, which was like, you know, the big 15,000 person conference that would sell out in two hours each year. And so um, I did that for, gosh, a number of years, you know, love speaking, love getting up on stage. And, and when our company finally decided to get rid of notes and go with SharePoint, I'm like, what do I do? You know, but you could see the trend in the industry, which was stuff going away from notes. SharePoint was really starting to take, you know, effect. And so I had to do a mind shift to say, do I really want to be a Lotus Notes evangelist or do I want to look at technology and say, what business things can I solve with the technology that I'm using? And once I got over that mental hump, which was quite difficult when your whole being tends to be wrapped up in, you know, the technology that you're working with, it was easier to start taking a step back and saying, okay, what can SharePoint do what can yeah. I do with SharePoint instead yeah. of how come SharePoint sucks and I can't do the same thing I do with Notes? Because Notes is a great tool and you can do a lot of stuff with it. You can do a lot of stuff with SharePoint too. It's just done differently. Um, I would say that the learning curve is a lot harder because in SharePoint development, you can be looking at the .NET stuff and you know the learning curve seems to go somewhat like this and I'm not quite sure that I'm ever going to be at that point where I'm going to say, well, I can go in and write, you know, to the C sharp APIs and, you know, do all these other things. That's just not going to be me. I'm going to be much more like yourself who can go out and say, what are all the web parts I have? What are the things I can do with the tools that come right out of the box? And what kind of benefit can I have for the business in terms of short turnaround, quick applications, quick lists that solve targeted business problems? And that's where I get my kicks. That's where I have fun. So it works well. Uh, yeah, don't like it. <laughs> yeah. You know, we need people like that, and I know that I need to do more with that. I need to learn more about that so I can do those kind of things when necessary. But when I look at some of the things that we've done, like I did this one uh, session called Out of the Box SharePoint, and it was taking a look at one of the set, uh, one of the applications that Sandra built, which was for URAC, which is a certification type thing. And it took, like you know, 28 people <laughs> out of the stream and made it a one-person project for what they had to do. And she didn't have to do any custom coding for it. It was all out-of-the-box type things. And she was able to deliver it in a very short period of time. The process works now where before it didn't. And I just look at that and go, why do I need to overcomplicate stuff? You know, why can't I build something that I can then hand over to the business user and say, you know, let me know if you have any questions, but other than that, that, I'm going on to do something else. And it works really well that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, and the thing that we also do or have a good time. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, one of the things that we also try to do is sometimes you have somebody come through and say, I want, you know, A through Z. And in a perfect world, they could have all that and it would be great. But if you can step them back and say, what exactly do you need to do what it is you have to do? Maybe the answer is really just A through F and everything else was a nice add-on. So what I tend to do a lot of times when I'm talking to the business unit is I'll target in on this is the one piece you're asking for that I don't know if I can do. And if this is critical to what you need, then we have to rethink what we're going to do. But if I can solve that little critical piece that you need with my skill base, then everything else you ask for is fine. Or I can tell them I can give you 80% of what you want in a couple weeks. Is that going to be a sufficient solution? And in many cases, you can bargain them down to you're asking for what you really need. You're not asking for what sounded great in a room. But in reality, you know, because I've got, unfortunately, 30 plus years of this stuff to go, you know, I've heard that about a dozen times. And I can tell you it sounds great. It doesn't work well. I'll build it for you. But you probably won't end up using it like you think you will. And working with a group of customers long term, like I do, instead of going from site to site to site, is I build up that trust level. So when I tell them, you may not want to do it this way, most of them will say, oh, OK, I trust you, and we can go from there. And I like having that level of relationship that you build up over time. And you've got those you know, emotional bank accounts that you can draw from if you screw something up. And you can say, oh, man, I messed that up. And everybody's like, OK, that's fine. That happens. But look at all the other cool stuff you did for us. You know, we move on. Why and what are we going to do different in the future? So. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and one, one thing that I give them, too, in that particular scenario is I tell them, I'm going to tell you no right now or no, I can't do that. But I give you permission to come back in six months and ask me the same question again, because I won't be the same developer in six months. And it could be that a week after I have the talk with them, you know, Sandra will give me a call and say, oh, look at the cool thing I just came up with. I'm like, oh, that would have been the perfect solution for such and such. Or the environment's changed to where we can do something now that we couldn't do before. I've learned SSRS. Oh, look at what that can do for us. All those things change. So if you give them the ability to say, I'll give you 80% now. We can, we can do this quickly. I can assure that you'll get it. I may not be able to do the last 20%, but why don't you just sit on it and either ask me again in six months or come back and say, okay, we need to do a phase two. We really need this. Then you can build on it from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've actually started to take that approach while we're in the budgeting, because we've been saying we're going to migrate now for like three years. <laughs> and we actually hope it's going to happen this time. But we've told people, you know, what you're asking for is possible, but it's going to take custom code. And if we end up in the cloud, it may not translate over real well. So can we either do it this other way, 
or SharePoint's not going to be a really good solution for what you want. We're not going to be able to support it the way it needs to be supported. And then they go on from there. I kind of come back to the whole thing of you're allowed to ask me again at some point um, because, again, things change. And, you know, we've all got our favorite people that we, you know, like dealing with and others that are our friends who pester us to no, you know, no end. But the thing is, because we work directly with the business, and because we are not interfacing through an IT barrier at all, they're getting, we are IT to the business. Um, we know that they are not going to be able, be able to explain it to us the way that we want them to explain it to us. We have to take their explanation and translate. Yep. yep. Very, very cool. All right. So this is another fun question. Um, and I purposely put this in here uh, because I think you span you know, a world of different careers and different uh, concepts from going from Lotus Notes community to SharePoint community and different things like that. And that's the infamous, if you could do it all over again, what would you do different? like the hot seat with Jen. <laughs> Ooh. I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't. <laughs> We still hear you. Oh, no. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, we still see you and hear you. <laughs>
Right, right. Well, I you mentioned a lot about the uh, Lotus community and the impact that you had on the Lotus community. And I just want to encourage you to not sell yourself short because you bring a tremendous amount of value to the SharePoint community. Um, just in just your engagement in it and talking and sharing. I mean, you're one of my favorites in this space because you're just so down to earth and real. So. When you start saying you have all this time in the community, you get you get to say that you're a rock star in the SharePoint community, Tom, because you totally are. Yes, you totally are, sir. Keep it up. Yes, I love it. I love it, sir. And so, um, uh, so funny Jen Mason story that you made me think of uh, when you said, "Oh yeah, you weren't even born when when I started." So. My first job as an intern out of college, I was working in a research and development company in Ohio, um, which my parents grew up in Ohio. I was born in Ohio, northern Ohio, but we moved when I was like one years old. So I'm a little intern, and I don't remember. We had a, a very fun team joking around, and you know how to get like that. And I don't remember why I said this to to someone, but I looked at my new boss and I said, oh, whatever, you're old enough to be my mother. Um, looking back at it, not really appropriate to say at work, but still all in just in fun. Her face turns like white and she goes pale. And she's like, oh my god, I went to school with your dad. And it turns out that my first boss out of, you know, as an intern out of college, my first manager went to high school with my dad, and the next day she brought in the school yearbook and showed me how she was in the same high school in northern Ohio with my father. And she, like, whenever I said that, it was like she, it like just flipped, and I don't know if she looked at me and realized, but um, it's kind of comical. So, uh, a little Jen Mason story there. So, you got to be careful with hard ass comments you in a meeting. Um, I told my dad it was a good thing that he was nice to her in high school. Um, <laughs> so it, was, it, was, it, was, it was funny, though. Funny. It's things you don't expect to have happen. So she's a super nice lady. I loved her to death. Learned so much from her. But it was great that she went to high school with my dad. Um, craziness. Crazy. Things you don't know about, don't know about Jen Mason. Um, OK, so we've got. Got about eight minutes. Uh, we will wrap it up with uh, me asking you what are your favorite fe features of the moment inside of Office 365 or SharePoint or whatever world you're in. What is your um, favorite uh, features that are out there right now? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, I was really bummed that that didn't transition into the 2013 workflow space. I was really, really, really bummed about that. Um, but I, I like those features. That's a good one. That's a that's a good a good feature. It's to our um, language, and we have to be that. Yeah, that's a fun one. I interesting. Have, so, and you guys not being on Office 365 yet, you kind of mentioned Delve. Is that one of the driving factors that is trying to get you guys? kind of pushing you guys to go there? There's a lot of things that are pushing us to go there. I think one of the things that we talked about, you know, when we were coming back from Ignite was if we upgraded to SharePoint 20 or yeah, SharePoint 2013 or 16, we'd be really doing the same thing that we're doing right now, only slightly differently. Right. Office 365 seems to jump you ahead of the scale to say now I can do things completely differently. I can really rework my ability to share documents, to interact with people outside the company. Um, the, the whole mobile experience becomes very real at that point. Uh, delve and the search starts to improve where people can go out and say, oh, you might be interested in this document because you've been working with this other person and they've been yeah. reading this same document. You wouldn't know that it exists otherwise. So there's a yeah. number of things that are pushing us in the Office 365 realm. And just, you know, one of the things is we're still on 2010. I mean, we need to get off of 2010. We need to get away from the extended support. We need to do something. If we're going to do something, why don't we do something that's going to make a huge difference? Because this is where the industry is going. Exactly. Let's go ahead and get up there instead of staying behind the, you know, curl of the wave and yeah. always being able or in the position yeah. of trying to find stuff afterwards. Yeah, pay for that last migration. Instead of paying for those migrations every couple of years, you can get them, you know, just yeah. Office 365 and then ride that wave. Uh, Tamara brings up another good point of some of, the, some of the features that are available in Office 365. Now this is, I mean, doable in on-prem if you take the time to do it and have the infrastructure and have everything mapped out, but the external users, just being able to share content with external right. users easily in a way that does not freak out IT and can be managed and controlled is just, mm -hmm. I mean, that is so worth it to me. And so those are some of the great free features that will get you there. But um, Tom yeah, has been Because we, awesome. we have people that come up to us and say, Go ahead. I was going to say, we have some people that come up to us and say, we need to interact with this other group of vendors outside our company. We've got all this stuff in a library document. How do we do that? And right now, I just have to say, you don't. And they say, well, what are my other options? Like, don't know. Can't help you on that. Yeah. Where with Office 365, that changes everything there. So Yeah. And it empowers people, which is so, so awesome. Um, but Tom, I was going to say, it has been Very so Super awesome having you out here today. I've loved getting um, to chat with you. I think you've got this a perspective that is awesome. So I would uh, love to have you back, especially as you guys are going from a transition from 2010 to Office 365. It would be super great um, to have you join us again and kind of give your perspective. So um, I just I loved having you on here. I would so. be more than happy to do so. Awesome. I'll pick you up Thank on you. that. Thank <laughs> you. Well, guys, uh, thanks for joining us today. Lyman is going to put up the um, the link for the next show. The next show, you actually kind of talked about this just a little bit, uh, Tom, where you said, how do I go from doing out of the box and going into that dev space? And what does that transition look like? And so I have got um, okay. Mark Anderson. Oh, this is going to be great. Tamara wants Mark to see this. Tamara wants to see this. That's awesome. Uh, but Mark Anderson is going to be joining us on the next episode of the call. 
Uh, but we're going to kind of be talking about that scenario of how do you transition from being somebody who does no code to some code, and when could you do that? How could you do that? So um, that should be a fun show. That would be a great um, one. So that's what our next one. Is. Our next one is, and we'd love to get your. Yeah, we'd love to get um, everyone's feedback on the evaluation form that pops up when you guys leave. And it has just been great having you guys here. So everybody have a wonderful rest of the day. And we'll see you guys again in two weeks. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.